Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel here on a given home Monday. <clears throat> and we're looking to the east today with Steve Zercher at Kansai Gaidai University in Kobe, Japan. You know, we, we always need to look at the east um, because we, you know, we here in Hawaii have a sort of better perception of the east than other places in the world. It's all, it's all positive. Japan is very positive for us. Uh, but Japan is having a big problem with coronavirus these days. And uh, can you give us a little a little precis on how the chart has moved up and down and down and up lately? Yeah, so um, we're under a state of national emergency now in Japan. So the prime minister decided to announce that uh, a week or so ago. And uh, that gave the local governments, initially it was in seven regions, uh, the ability to issue edicts that people do stay in place and businesses close. So basically what you and Hawaii have been going through for what it's been about a month or so now, um, I believe, uh, is now in place. Initially, it was just for a part of the country where most of the virus infections had been growing. And then uh, a few days ago, the prime minister announced it for the entire country. So the entire country now is under a stay in place recommendation and businesses are being encouraged um, to shorten their hours or in some case only have food be available on a delivery basis. Like again, in Hawaii, that, that happened just as I was leaving in March in Hawaii. Um, unfortunately though, the infection rates are still uh, by a Japanese standard, uh, still increasing quite significantly uh, on the order of four, three to 400 a day, uh, sometimes as high as five or 600. Oh, wow. So even though we are, have been under this new regimen now for uh, you know, a fairly uh, decent amount of time, uh, the uh, flattening of the curve, as we've seen in other countries, uh, is not yet occurring. So it's still unknown whether or not we'll be able as a country to <clears throat> flatten the curve and have the infection rates go down to a manageable number, and one at which the government would feel comfortable and people would feel comfortable uh, opening up the schools again and uh, being opening up the businesses again and so forth. So, what's the still... hole in the boat, Steve? Something Pardon? is wrong. Something is wrong. These um, these methods should be working. You should be able to flatten the curve if you have a you know mm -hmm. a well organized and enforced. Uh, quarantine arrangement, um, something is, is a problem. What is it? Um, that's a good question. I, these, the recommendations, these uh, statements from the government are not mandatory. So even though in general, Japanese people, Japanese uh, culture uh, is more obedient and more likely to uh, follow statements from the government. There are, there are um, <clears throat> businesses and people who are still going out and about and uh, still conducting themselves <clears throat> in a way that they had been doing before the national emergency had been stated. And also, it's hard to tell because uh, there may be a legacy influence. <clears throat> These infections may be occurring because of infections or transmission that occurred a couple weeks ago. You know, before the national emergency had actually begun or started. So the expectation is that those numbers will begin to go down as they have in other countries. Um, but if they don't, it will be because the adherence to these rules are still not 100%. I would say probably 70% being followed, but that last 30% is still open. So why doesn't the government order this, the, the shutdown? Another, another good question. Jay, you're on your game today. <laughs> so, <laughs> as as usual, uh, there's there's two two reasons for that. One is the same thing that you experience in the United States. There's a reluctance on the part of a government to be too overly controlling on this, because the influence on business would be so severe. There's always that question: if we move to a total shutdown, then the economy will get even worse than we know it's it is right now. And then also uh, as a part of the nature of Japanese government, they do not actually, they claim to not have the right to order that. They can only recommend. They can only say, this is what we think you should do. And in most cases, that's sufficient. They don't have the right at a national level and also at a regional level to 
issue the mandate. They probably can do that if they want to, but they're saying that they cannot do that. So they're re resistant or reluctant to do that. You know what tells me, I'll tell you what it tells me, is that in the past, in, even within your you know, years uh, of teaching at uh, Kobe, um, if the government said something, you know, even asking for voluntary compliance, mm -hmm. people were very likely to do it because that's, that's the base, basic Japanese culture point. Right. That's the way it works. You, it's you respect the people in authority. Mm -hmm. um, but things have changed. That's what it tells me. Mm. And that a, a few years later, um, the government makes a, quote, suggestion, and not everybody wants to follow it. They, are, they have changed. They have changed in their relation to the government, their sense of individualism, their sense of, uh, you know, the, the societal fabric. That's, that's what I get out of what you just said. That could be a part of it. There, that could be uh, an evolution of the perception of the role of government and the uh, willingness to adhere to these recommendations. Another factor too, uh, is that there are certain cultural traps that this is exposing. One of them has to do with how business is conducted in Japan. So we've talked about this in previous shows that uh, Japanese employees are measured by the amount of time they spend in the office generally. There's a strong preference for people to work in the company and telework is something that's really not utilized very much in this country. Now, since the crisis has begun, there's been a lot of encouragement on the part of government and also by companies as well, some of them, to have the employees stay at home and do their work remotely. Uh, and that's having some effect. The commuting on the trains, you can see that the number of people are down, but still the trains are crowded during the work hours. So why is that? There's still this preference that if you're not in the office, you're not doing work. It's really not possible to do work outside of the office. And one small example of this that I talked with you before we started rolling on this is the use of a chop or the, it's called a Japanese honko. So it's required for business documents to be officially approved that it ha has to go through a series of stamps by various offices. And this is done by an individual who has control of his individual honko or chop and only he or she has the ability to do that. So even if the employees want to stay at home, oftentimes they have to go to work in order to carry out that particular process, which is deeply embedded in Japanese business culture. And even though there's lots of software products that can simulate this, there's hundreds of them. Many Japanese companies have started this up. There's still this preference for this process to be done in person. That the no, sense is, I'll if it's not a, done in person, it's not official. I'll so that's causing people prediction. to go to work. These, these are holes in the boat. Yes. Um, and uh, we'll talk about how they might be changing, but uh, the changes mm -hmm. are not sufficient to flatten the curve. And so I, I give you a prediction. I give you a prediction that, um, you know, whatever is coming down from the government is not sufficient to make people voluntarily comply. Um, the curve will not be flattened or not sufficiently flattened. There'll be more cases, more deaths. And after a while, um, there'll be a blame game and Abe won't last in office. And then somebody else will come in and say, no, you've got to stay home. You really have to. And yeah. then the curve will come down. And that's tragic because it means that the cases between now and then, the deaths between now and then, are not necessary. And, uh, you know, we, uh, the Japanese are learning the hard way. And, and so is so are the Americans, by the way. I, I wouldn't make a big difference there. Uh, right. So yeah, I think, I think the approach to the crisis is similar between the two countries. That it, it's not, There's not been a clear strategy. And um, even when the stay-in-place announcements are made, uh, they're not adhered to. So the government's vacillating somewhat on this. <clears throat> and um, also, it varies by region. So maybe the government, governor of one region <clears throat> will be more active and <clears throat> encouraging businesses in a stronger way to try and shut down. But where I live, for example, the governor is less active. Mm -hmm. So if he doesn't want to influence business negatively. Mm -hmm. So that's, it's that, again, business versus health. Well, what, what are people in... Um in Japan think about the contention that's going on now between business versus health, um, between um, you know, Trump's uh, demand that everybody return to business, 
uh, his inciting um, uh, the right wing Republican crowd to go protest and protest to open open the economy up again. What do people in Japan think about that? They must have a, interesting reactions to that. Um, I, that is being reported, uh, but I think it's perceived as a fringe element. And certainly none of that is happening here. Mm. Good. So one, one thing that Japan doesn't have is this kind of, uh, they're fringe parties and especially on the far right and every once in a while you'll see them in the public. But in general, uh, that type of activity doesn't occur. The, the role of religion, for example, in government is much less reduced as opposed to the United States where mm -hmm. evangelical groups have a lot of political influence, a lot of political power. So and when it comes to the Trump people, that kind of overlaps between politically right wing and then religious. So J Japan doesn't have that. Uh, there's that type of reaction um, is not occurring here. So I think my, my impression would be if people here read about that type of activity, they just think that that's some kind of strange idiosyncrasy of the American political system. Well, but it is. I can't imagine it is that they're accurately. Here. That's an accurate perception. Yeah, that's not happening here. I mean, people may not be happy with this, and they may be breaking the rules, uh, but they're not protesting. Um, hmm. you know, and there's not a sense of, uh, I, I think, in general, people believe that the government is muddled, has not done this in a clear and comprehensive way, but they're, they're making the best efforts, and hmm. that generally they're doing the right thing to try and reduce the health uh, impact. Of hey, the what about the technology? I mean, Japan's a very innovative place, a very, uh, you know, robust kind of technology culture. Mm. Um, uh, you would think, and I know you have some examples of this, that there is movement, um, that uh, there, are, there are things that are happening in, in, in the daily life in Japan that wouldn't have happened before, and mm. that people are getting off old culture points and onto more innovative ones because of the virus. Can you talk about that? Yeah, yeah. So I'm within my micro environment as a dean at Kansai Gaidai University. Um, I've been at the school for almost 10 years. I, I'm very uh, familiar. I've grown accustomed uh, to how things are run or managed. It's usually in a very slow, incremental way. I mean, whenever I had made requests for changes in the past, um, usually the administration, you know, the, I'm never sh quite sure who makes these decisions or how they're done, but the answer is generally no. Um, but to my delight, I've discovered that in the last two months, as the department that I managed moved from in-class education to Zoom, like we're doing right now, education, that the administration recognizes that we're in kind of a special situation and my requests for changes, like for example, processing expenses. In the past, that had always been done in person. Jay, literally, you have to fill out a form and paper, submit it, get it approved, then you go buy your file folders or whatever that may be, then you get the receipt and the file folders and you take them to the office that processes this and you show them the receipt and you show them the product that you bought. Can you believe that? This is how it works. So I sent a note a couple of days ago to the people who manage this and say, hey, look, you know, we're being told not to come to campus. We can't show you the receipts. We can't show you the file folders or the paper. Can we do this digitally? And they said, oh, that's a very good suggestion, Steve. Yeah, we'll think about that and get back. I, you know. <laughs> so there are these types of uh, accommodations that are occurring because I guess Japan recognizes, and again, this is at a micro level, but I think you can uh, apply this to the country as a whole, that we need to do things differently. And sometimes it's really resulting in positive improvements, which should have been done years and years and years ago. Like the Honko, the stamp that I talked about earlier, that should have been eliminated decades ago. But now it's clear that it has to go. Yeah. So another, you know, example, these, these... Go ahead. Sorry. another example is that uh, professors in the past had not been able to access the database resources like JSTOR, for example, unless they were in the library. It's like, oh, you cannot do research unless you're physically within the walls of the library. You cannot do it from home and log in. So I made that request a few days ago, two hours. They said, okay, we can do it. Before I was always told no. 
So this is one thing that's occurring kind of underneath this crisis, which I think maybe will bode well for Japan once we get out of this, you know, six months from now, whatever it may be. Yeah, I think I think that's happening in the U.S. too. That sort of thing. I, I have I have similar examples to give you, but but I but I noticed that there, you know, these these things we're talking about, both you and me, these things are not mm, profound economic changes. Mm. Um, they're they they're not changes that deal with um, you know large concentrations of capital or or you know sweeping sweeping differences in the way our capital structure operates. Mm. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, I just want to keep my eyes on this, and I'm sure you want to keep your eyes on it. Is we, we know we're going to be different. Mm. We know whether it's we're out of here in um, three months or six months or a year, we know it's all going to be different. Healthcare, for example, we know that it'd be sweeping. But, right. but the question is whether it'll be better uh or whether it will be more difficult to achieve a quality of life uh mm. whether we'll eat better s- sleep better be able to do the things we want to do mm. uh, and whether our government will function better mm. it's actually i i feel that it wouldn't be too hard for our government to function better here in these united states that would be <laughs> easy <laughs> anything that happens would make that easy <clears throat> but right. you know i think i think the changes could be really profound Mm. And not just a matter of uh, whether you need a chop, um, mm. you know, but changes that uh, involve um, everything, every, all of our relationships with each other, uh, with the material world, with the government, with other countries, with cultures. Uh, and that makes it to such an exciting time, although it's a little dangerous, too. What are your thoughts mm. about that? Yeah, I have that feeling as well uh, that through a crisis, uh, positive change can occur. Of course, nobody wants this to be happening because so many people are getting sick and unfortunately many people are dying. But if you step back from that and take a look at how society is being affected by this, and it is, I think the major point, Jay, is that it's putting people into a state of thinking or being open to change and to doing things in a different way. So one small example um, is uh, in Japan right now, if you are in grammar school, uh, you have no access to computers at all, which which is remarkable, right? So my children who are going to Japanese schools for for their grammar school days never saw a computer in school at all. And then we put them into international school, into seventh grade, and it's required that they have a computer. And my, my boys are just shocked about that, right? So the Japan had been planning for many, many years to introduce technology into the grammar school level to have every child in school in Japan have a computer, which is a good thing, right? I mean, because that's the world that they'll be living in for the rest of their lives. It's always talked about and pushed into the future. But because of this crisis, it's going to happen now. Japan recognizes through this crisis that they're behind when it comes to introducing technology and having the Japanese children grow up with it. So it's something that they feel comfortable using and will uh, then therefore accommodate change on a faster basis using technology. So that's at a macro level. And we're talking big investment there and a huge impact on how Japanese education is carried out because of the crisis that the window for that, which is always like two or three years from now, every year it was two or three years from now as we go forward is now now is happening now the government is going to pass regulations and, and uh, allow this to occur mm-hmm. through this crisis so that's a, a macro example of a fundamental change that will occur to society and have tremendous impact on business whoever provides the computers if it's apple or somebody else it's gonna be huge yeah well crises crises tend to uh, reveal the you know the the inside of things uh, and i'm i'm just you you remind me of uh, of the mass arrests in Hong Kong these days over the weekend where uh, the PRC arrested uh, the, the Democrat, the democracy leaders, including uh, what's his name, Martin Lee over there, which mm. is really, uh, really an astounding thing to do in the middle of a crisis. Mm. Uh, and, and the Chinese government has really not been not been up to a high moral plane on dealing with the crisis. Mm. They've uh, they've made it hard for people and uh, unnecessarily so. And now and now uh, di- diverting everything 
um, to uh, a, a really negative move in Hong Kong. Why? It's hard to believe that they're doing this, but I can't imagine why. And, and I only mention this to say that there will be people who take advantage mm. of the crisis. There will be opportunists, including mm. political leaders, who will use it for their own advantage. Mm. Some say that Trump is doing exactly that. Right. Um, so at the end of the day, it's hard to say who prevails, uh, the good guys or the ones who, the opportunists. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I think uh, that uh, this crisis in Japan is also exposing some of the weaknesses in the leadership. We've had the same prime minister now for many, many years, Prime Minister Abe. And through, I would say, primarily uh, manipulation of the media, and the use of political propaganda, not really based on results, but more on perception of results. He's been able to maintain popularity and, and control. But through the crisis, uh, there's a big growing frustration with his uh, lack of leadership. And sometimes he acts totally independent of others, makes decisions just on his own. And it's beginning to frustrate his coalition partners and also his popularity is beginning to go down. So at a macro level, uh, what you're talking about, uh, I mean, not, not the surveillance of people, what you're talking about in Hong Kong, but at a macro level, there may be a significant change in the Japanese government as a result of this crisis. And again, to get to your question, who will take his place? Will it be someone who can lead Japan forward? Uh, you know, Abe is more of a reactionary type of leader. He, he's thinking about more about the glories of Japan in the past. This is my perception. But Japan needs a, a progressive, open-minded, courageous leader to move it to the next level. Otherwise, Japan as a country will sink from number three in the world to number four, five, six, seven, you know, and will drop down on the top 10 list of major economies. You can see mm. that happening unless mm. there's greater strength of leadership. So the crisis is creating the opportunity for maybe someone to come in who's like that. But I can tell you that probably we won't get someone like that. We'll get someone who's more or less similar to what we have right now. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. What about uh, the young I, I people? I hate to be cynical about it. What about the young people that you run into in, in uh, <laughs> Kansai Gaidai University? Uh, the Japanese now. I'm not talking about the you know international crowd. Right. But the Japanese. Uh, what are they like? Are these are they sensitive to these issues? Uh, are, are they um, you know uh, aware of the, the possibilities? Are they thinking about becoming more influential in in the society there? Uh, um, where are the you know, leaders coming from? Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't have a sense of what they're thinking now because I'm not seeing them face to face anymore. I, we stopped that, mm. you know, in uh, the beginning of March. So it's been you know six, seven weeks now. I, I'm interacting with them, but it's through it's through um, digital means. So I don't have a sense of that. In, before that, though, my sense was that the Japanese, and this is not unfortunately, this is not a positive thing to say. Uh, they're apolitical generally. And when they do express their preference on politics, it tends to be quite conservative, which is kind of counter to how youth is generally perceived. Younger people are tended, like in America, they're Bernie supporters and so forth, predominantly. The, my nephew in Hawaii was so disappointed when Bernie pulled out. I mean, he, he was apolitical up until Bernie appeared. And all of a sudden he became, hey, I really like this guy. This guy's good. And he was depressed. I don't see that type of level of political engagement generally in the students. Mm. They, when I asked them about what's going on, this is pre-crisis. You know, have you read about this? And generally the answer is no. Well, that's a lot of people, <clears throat> a lot of people in the U.S., a lot of kids like that here in Hawaii. And it's, it's regrettable because now is the time we need them. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> and, and, and not to be uh, ide ideologues about it, but just to be informed. Mm. <clears throat> but you raise one other question I'd like to ask you. We only have a minute left here. And that is, you know, so you have been engaged and many faculty around the world have been engaged uh, with your students online, on Zoom. And mm -hmm. that's a different paradigm. It's a different way of teaching, different way of yep. getting response. Right. But it strikes me that inherent in what you're saying is that <clears throat> uh, although Zoom has a Zoom type programs have a, a really powerful uh, tech, technological leverage in teaching students and in mm -hmm. doing the classroom, so to speak. There, there are things that you miss also. Um, <clears throat> uh, you, you, maybe you can't provoke, engage, uh, re get their reactions, 
teach them, mm -hmm. open their minds possibly in the same way as if you were flesh and blood. What do you think? Yeah, I that is the um, observation of the professor so far. So we're, we're kind of a small case study because we were teaching in class. We started classes in late January. So we went late January through February in, in person. And then like that, Abe made an announcement that all classroom engagement had to stop. So we switched over. And, um, you know, I met with the faculty uh, just last weekend and we kind of discussed this. And I think um, that is the sense that uh, the engagement with the students is much reduced. Uh, we have a problem of missing students. So our, our students are primarily international students. And we encourage them once this crisis really began to grow in Japan to go back home. So about 60% of our students have returned home. So now our students are spread out all over the world. You can imagine. So you may be teaching Zoom and your students are everywhere. So we have a certain percentage, maybe like 5% or as high as 10% in some cases of students that have just disappeared. And we can't contact them and they're not responding. So that's an issue that we're facing. And for the professors who truly like the engagement and discussion, teach them that way. For them, it's been a very, very hard transition. Now, Jay, also just briefly, uh, this semester, sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. And I was interested in online education, which in Japan, because of this digital gap that exists, online education in Japan basically doesn't exist. So I started an online course with the University of Hawaii, West Oahu. And we've mixed local students, West Oahu students, with Japanese and also international students. And we've been running that through the semester starting in late January. And that, of course, has continued uninterrupted because we, we weren't in class to begin with. And that's actually turning out quite well. Um, it's not the same as teaching in class, but that class we're using synchronous once a week and then asynchronous for the rest. Mm. And uh, my sense of that, my observation, I'll have to ask the students once the semester is over what they think, but that seems to be going okay. And uh, there is a genuine learning process that's going on and there's team engagement and the Zoom sessions, just like we're doing right now, um, are, are effective. You know, you can put them into groups, for example, and they do discussions. And the, the, the students just pick it up right away and enter into discussions. It's actually pretty smooth. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe the technology is, uh, is, is ahead of us. So Zoom is creating all these different changes and methodologies to teach people. So yeah. maybe, maybe it's just a matter of taking advantage of, that, of that, those new innovations and uh, also learning more about how to teach. And uh, at the end of the day, it'll be, you know, pretty good experience. And, and, one, and other, indeed, one, other, one other wrinkle, Jay, to this is that Zoom, of course, was developed and utilized up until when the crisis started as a business meeting forum. Mm -hmm. You know, it was always set up in a business context. Because people are in stay in place and part of Japanese business culture is to gather together after work and go drinking. And now that cannot happen, right? So you cannot do that any longer. People are using Zoom. So there are now kanpai parties or drinking parties that are carried out after work hours. People have a wine or a beer in their hand. They connect with their colleagues, you know, 10 or 20 of them. And uh, it somehow works. So my wife went on this. She works for a major American company. And she wasn't really all that positive about it, but she ended up talking with these people for like two or three hours and drinking quite a bit of wine in the process. <laughs> so now I've actually set this up for my professors at the end of the semester <laughs> to celebrate what we've gone through. I'm going to be buying beer for them, craft beer, and send them all craft beer. And we're going to use Zoom as a uh, end of semester party. So this is another kind of wrinkle that's appearing. Zoom is becoming a social tool in addition to it being a business tool. So Jay, yeah. you know, we talk, we've talked about sharing martinis. We, we can't do that right now, but maybe over Zoom, we can have a martini party. Uh, I'm on, you're on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Steve. I learned so much from you about so many things. <laughs> talk My to you in a couple of great. weeks. Be yeah. well, stay yeah, safe. Yeah, see you in a couple of weeks. Hopefully in summer, I'll see you in person if it all works out. I'm looking forward. You take care. Thank Wash you so much. Wash your hands. Yeah. <laughs>